In this installment of Avionics Education, we'll cover the checkout of an aircraft system that's becoming rare, but not unknown, the Distance Measuring Equipment, or DME. Hello and welcome back to Avionics Education. My name is Bruce Bissett. Today we're going to perform a cockpit checkout of the DME system. Now with the inclusion of GPS and most modern aircraft, most aircraft no longer have this system installed. However, it still can be found in some and will need to be maintained. Now another reason one might need to learn about the DME system is because it is one of the NCAT dependent navigation system add-on rating subjects. Also, there are a couple of references to the system in the FCC growl and as a subject in the FAA airframe mechanics test. So the system is still going to be around and we still have to learn how it works. Today, I'm only going to cover this as an introduction to the subject. The DME equipment information is found in ATA Chapter 34 under Navigation. However, we'll need to have a working knowledge of ATA 24 Audio Selection and Distribution to be able to perform this confidence check. Now, the DME system operates the same way for large aircraft as small ones. The difference is going to be how each aircraft displays the information. Now, if you were to do maintenance on a DME system and need to do a functional test, all it does, a technician needs to access a local station to perform a validation test of the receiver. You could locate a sectional or instrument landing chart to find that nearby VOR ILS frequency. The chart will have the frequency for the local station. Now, depending on obstructions like trees and hangars, you may want to choose either the VIA, the ILS, or the VOR. Now, in this example, both stations are located on the south end of the airport. The aircraft you're testing is at a gate on the northwest end of the runway. Remember to check the audio signal that's broadcast from the station. In this example, the ILS frequency is 111.7 and the VOR is 116.0 megahertz. The identifiers for the audio will be the same and it's shown in the Morse code on the chart, except the ILS will have the Morse code identifier I in front of it, which is just two dots. To perform the quick test, apply power for the aircraft. Now, some modern aircraft may need the INS system aligned to display DME information on the glass navigation instruments. Next, locate the navigation tuning panels. The knob on this panel for, for the right side is for changing the frequency. The left window will indicate the active frequency. Now, for the standby win window on the right-hand side, to change its frequency, you turn the large knob, which will change the digits to the left of the decimal and the small knob to the right. Once the proper frequency is set, press the transfer button to move it from the tuning window to the active window. Next, we're going to set up the audio selector. And this aircraft is just aft of the nav panel. We need this to be able to hear the audio. The buttons along the top are for selecting what transmitter is going to be used for that on-site system. The left panel is for the captain, and the right is for the first officer side. Now, since we don't want to broadcast, which means we don't want to have any microphones selected to either a comm or an app. Now, depending on the aircraft, you could turn off the microphone by pressing the buttons along the top row of the audio selector. However, if it does not turn off, in other words, you have to have one microphone on, then selecting the flight or service interphone is a safe bet to prevent inadvertent broadcasts. 
The round buttons on this example are actually the audio sound channel controls for each receiver in the aircraft. Now by pressing the knob to the out position, this will activate the channel. The button will have a white edge along the bottom, and when out, the pilot can see that that channel is open. Now, the default output would always be the headset jacks. However, most technicians find the speaker to be practical for testing. So the knob labeled SPKR will need to provide the audio over the pilot's head, the speaker over the pilot's head. Now, that both those knobs for the DME, or nav in this case, and the speaker need to be about half scale to be able to hear it. Then the next step is to set the audio channel to hear the identifier instead of the audio broadcast that some VOR stations are known to provide. There's a three position switch marked voice B, B both, and R range. We need to select it to the R range, which is actually the Morse code identifier part of the message. Now, if you don't hear the identifier, increase the volume for the nav control knob to be able to hear it. The ILS and VOR will broadcast their identifiers over basically the same channel as the DME. There'll be a broadcast every 15 seconds for the VOR ILS, and then one every minute for the DME. Now, the DME audio signal will have a much higher tone than the VOR ILS, even though it'll be the same Morse code identifier. Next, we need to verify that the DME has captured and is putting out a mileage indication. Now, as soon as the nav is tuned to the station, the receiver should put a mileage number based on the distance from the station. Now, this information can be displayed as part of the HSI, Horizontal Situation Indicator, or the Primary Flight Display, or in a separate window in a panel for an analog flight deck, an older style. Next, press the Transfer button to ensure that the display blanks out after 10 seconds. Then press the Transfer button again to ensure that the DME require, acquires again. The point is this thing has a hold over memory that allows for periodic blanking of signal for about 10 seconds before it shuts off. When it shuts off, it would usually be flagged as we call it. For aircraft electronic displays, sometimes the proper window needs to be selected to display the information. For example, if the navigation display, ND, is in the planning mode, the DME and other navigation information may not be displayed on that page. Also, the display may not be in the VR ILS mode to display DME. If it's in an actual navigation mode using GPS or INS information, then DME will not be displayed. Looking at general aviation aircraft, the DME is usually a separate unit that's located in the panel in the radio stack. As I mentioned before, GPS is replacing many of the DME receivers in these types of aircraft. But it's estimated about a third of all aircraft equipped for IFR flight will still have the DME installed. The most common type of unit today found in general aviation aircraft is the King Radio KX67A. Now, King Radio was sold to Honeywell and will still support the equipment if you need to have it repaired. The King unit will display all the information on the front of the unit. Its simplest form will have simply a connector for power, another for the small antenna that we mounted to the bottom of the aircraft. Now there's going to be two other wire connections. One that will connect the suppression line to prevent the DME from broadcasting or receiving when the ATC RBS or transponder is replying. Now there'll be another set of wires that'll be provided to provide the audio high and low for the audio selector panel. The LED display, mode selector switch, on-off switch, and frequency tuner are on the face. 
Now the three position switch is for remote, frequency, and ground speed time. We'll set the switch to the center frequency position to tune the VOR or ILS station nearby to test the unit. If the aircraft is to be set up and use the remote function, then we would tune the VOR ILS on the nav unit and the remote function will allow automatic tuning for this particular brand of radio. If a station is within range, the mileage information will be displayed in tenths of a mile. Now, since the aircraft is not moving, there will not be a ground speed time calculated. However, this can be set up with a ground tester, and we'll cover that later. Now, here hear audio in this type of system, we need to go to the audio selector panel. For this older style, the upper rows of buttons feed the audio to the cockpit speaker and the lower for the headset. Now, audio can only be heard in the DME identifier once a minute, like we talked about before. If you want to learn more about the DME system, I have an online course as part of the Pulse Radio System training on my Thinkific website the link for which I'll have below in the comment section. If you liked what I presented and wanted to see more, please press the like button and share with anyone that might be interested in other avionics maintenance subjects. Also, if you want to know when other videos come out, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. And if you have questions or comments or even suggestions of what else you'd like to see on this channel in future videos, Put a comment in the comment section. I look at them all every day. Hey, thanks for viewing this video this long, and I look forward for you to seeing me in the next one. Until next time, keep it safe.